I'm going to talk about the Martian mission. So first, before that, I have to talk about the propulsion systems that are currently used on board spacecrafts, uh, chemical and electrical versions of that. And then I have to talk about the impulsive and low thrust uh, techniques in the, that are used in designing trajectories for uh, interplanetary uh, transfers. Uh, I talk about the typical Earth-Mars missions uh, uh, approaches the Hoffman transfer and the pork chop plots that are used. And then I will talk about the gravity assist maneuver, which is a prelude to the rich uh, Pernell maneuver used in the <clears throat> Martian uh, mission. So if you look at this picture on the left, you will see a typical electrical propulsion. And it shows the amount of the force created by these, which are usually obtained by uh, expelling charged particles out of the engine. And you can see that uh, it's a very small value of the force that, by comparison, it was mentioned that it's uh, equivalent to four sheets of paper. And on the right, we have the chemical propulsion, which creates a, an enormous amount of force, uh, but in a, in a very low amount of time. It's on the order of minutes, but for the electrical engines, you will see that they can run uh, for months or even years. And the efficient factor in consuming fuel is measured in terms of the, uh, we have a measure for that, we call it a specific impulse. It determines how efficient an engine is consuming the propellant. And for the electrical uh, spacecrafts, electrical engines, that number is 10 times or even more than the chemical rockets. So what is the consequence of that? It means that the typical version of designing the trajectories, let's say from Earth to, uh, to outer, outer planets, we are actually applying some impulses because the amount of activation of the thrust compared with the length of the transfer is very small. So the, the, the design or the optimization procedure becomes a finite continuous design uh, variables. And our objective is to determine both the direction and magnitude of these vectors. And there are a very uh, a small amount of them that we have to determine. On the way to the target, as you can see, we are, uh, we are able to use the, uh, the gravitational force of the planets, which is called a swing by or a slingshot. But the, the challenging part is that if we move to the low thrust engines, then the engines have to run for a longer time and as a consequence, we have to determine the direction and velocity, the direction and uh, magnitude of the thrust force over a very, very longer period of time. Besides, we, there are cases in which that the thrust, uh, that the, the engines go off and on. So we have a modulation on the thrust. It, it, the, the problem thus becomes really challenging, but due to the advantage and efficiency in consuming fuel, most of the missions are uh, targeted at using these uh, low thrust electrical engines. So the typical, uh, the simplest way to design a transfer between Earth and Mars is called the Hoffman transfer. It basically assumes that the, the Mars orbit and Earth orbit are pure circular. And then we are going to have a transfer, an elliptical transfer that, uh, that uses two impulses, one at perigee and one at apogee. So with these two, the transfer is actually going to happen on the right branch of this ellipse, and then we apply the second impulse, and we, we are actually reaching the uh, Mars orbit. However, as you can see, the transfer time between Earth and Mars using a Hamann transfer takes approximately 8.5 months. And, uh, we have, to, we have to wait for the correct time if we want to perform a maneuver. So they are fuel efficient, but they are using two impulses, and we have to wait for the correct phasing between Earth and Mars. The other way is called the, uh, actually, this is how uh, experts are designing the transfer trajectories at NASA and other companies. It's basically using the Lambert problem, the solution of the Lambert problem, which is if you have two vectors in a space and you want to connect them with, it, with the arc given the time of flight, then it determines what type of the trajectory that is. So if you 
brute force the departure time and the time of flight and search for the transfers and plot the results, you will, you will get so, uh, figures like this. They are called pork chop plots. And by looking at, for example, this region, you will realize that if you depart the spacecraft uh, 50 days after 28th of August of 2024, it requires the minimum amount of fuel in order to reach Mars. And well, we have to, they have to look at various uh, pork chop plots for designing most efficient trajectories. Uh, and this is done for Mars and even other planets. However, this is without using the energy of the planets uh, along the trajectory. In other words, there is a concept that is called gravity assist maneuver. The essence of that is that if you look at the blue vector that I've written, that I've uh, shown here, around every planet we have a hypothetical, uh, we can assume that we have a hypothetical sphere within which the spacecraft is influenced only by the central body. That is called the sphere of influence. So at the, edge of, of the, at the edges of these sphere of influence, the velocity of the spacecraft is important. As you can see, at the entrance of this condition, the velocity at the entrance is bigger than the velocity at the exit. This is called a leading edge flyby. So whenever we have a leading edge flyby, the net result is that the velocity of the spacecraft is going to be reduced. So this is, in some cases, useful. In some cases, it's not. For example, if you want to reduce the overall velocity of the spacecraft to, uh, for example, do a mapping of uh, one of the planets, then arriving at a high velocity, you need to reduce the overall velocity of the spacecraft, and you have to perform several leading edge flybys. On the other hand, if you have a trailing edge fly flyby, you will see that the component of the velocity of the central body is going to be added to the initial velocity, which makes the final total velocity bigger than the initial one. So whenever you have a trailing edge flyby, the spacecraft, the central body is actually helping you and provides extra energy with which you can uh, design efficiently your, your transfer. But the most important thing is that you have to come up with the correct timing and sequences in order to perform those maneuvers. For example, the Voyager missions, there is a special alignment that repeats, uh, I think, 120 every 128 years, such that you can perform missions like Voyagers. So here is the, uh, the breakdown of the Hermes mission. And as you can see, the first leg starts, uh, the Ares 3 mission starts. And uh, well, uh, OK, yeah, it leaves Earth and on, a, on a branch, and then it, it, uh, it reaches Mars, and then they have uh, 120 days of uh, transfer in order to reach to Mars, which is at a distance of 150 million miles. And then, uh, well, due to the storm that occurred uh, on the surface of the Mars, they have to abort the mission. But inadvertently, they uh, leave behind uh, Mark Watney, and then they have to return to Earth. However, on the way, on the on the way, on the course uh, that transferred them to the Earth, uh, they did a maneuver which was called Rich Pernul Maneuver, which is basically a combination of gravity assist with the Earth in order to gain advantage of the speed and shorter, shorten the time of flight so that they can again go and visit Mars. Then, once they have the uh, flyby with the Mars, they capture the uh, they, they capture Watney, and then they said, uh, you're going to uh, have another flyby by the Mars, and then they will put on a transfer trajectory that sends them to the Earth. So here is a graphic of the, uh, this trajectory that I simulated based on the dates that we had available. OK, so the spacecraft departs Earth, reaches Mars, and then returns back. Here is where the uh, the Pernal mission uh, maneuver starts. They have a flyby, and then they go and meet, or have a rendezvous with the, with the Mars and catch uh, the astronaut, and then return back to the uh, to the Earth. So as you can see, uh, this is this is the the, the gravity flyby assist maneuver, uh, and this uh, one thing which is very important is that 
when you did the analysis, most of the time the mission designers avoid going very close to the moon, to the sun, because of the radiations. It's very dangerous for the astronauts. But apparently the distance between sun and the minimum, uh, between sun and the minimum distance uh, of the trajectory is about 45 million uh, miles, which is less than the typical value which is used, which is around 75 million miles. Uh, the other th uh, dangerous thing about this mission is that once you reach the, uh, uh, once you go into the sphere of influence of the Mars, if you look at the gravity assist maneuver that I mentioned, the orbit is going to be a hyperbolic. So it's not a closed orbit. So you only have one chance of getting the astro astronaut. Otherwise, he's going to be, he's going to stay there forever. So. You can imagine that uh, this is actually a, a very, uh, a very uh, dangerous mission. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, when you look at the existing technology to use the low thrust engines, uh, you will see that the amount of uh, thrust which is required, you have to stack up several low thrust electrical engines. And one problem to that is the power consumption. So uh, roughly spe speaking, this mission is not doable if we are not able to provide enough power to the electrical engines. And that's something that uh, researchers, even here at the University of Michigan, are working on uh, increasing uh, the efficiency of the thrusters and reducing their, their power consumption. So. Uh, I think that concludes uh, my presentation, and I would be happy to take your question later.